Okay, so just a heads up before I get into all the mathy stuff that is in this video, I just wanted to let you know that some of the material in this video is gonna make more sense if you've seen at least the first half of the previous video that I did about constructing larger infinities. I've linked it up here in the cards if you're interested, otherwise I'll just continue, we'll get through this, it'll be great. So when we were talking about equating the cardinality of two sets, we talked about it being done with bijections, or functions that are both injective and surjective. In other words, each domain element hits a unique target, and everything in the target is hit. Sometimes though, it can be kind of difficult to just look at two sets and construct a bijection between them to show that they have the same cardinality. For instance, take the open interval from 0 to 1 and the closed interval from 0 to 1. I claim that these two sets have the same cardinality, but writing down the actual bijection between these two sets is a bit of a chore if you don't know where to start. That's actually where the Kanner Schroeder Bernstein theorem, which is otherwise known as the Kanner Bernstein or the Schroeder Bernstein theorem, comes in handy. Here's a little bit of motivation. Say you have two containers, A and B, that at first look like they can carry different amounts of water. So, in order to test this idea, you decide to fill up A all the way up with fluid and then pour it into container B. And you find out that only part of B is filled by the volume of A. At first, you think that this means that B must be the larger container, but out of curiosity, you decide to fill B up with water and then pour it into A as well, just to make sure. And then something confusing happens. You'd expect that B would overflow A, but the volume of B only fills up part of A as well. Physically, this should feel like a contradiction, but it actually would be possible as long as that part of the container that you're filling up was actually the entire container each time. So if this were to happen, the containers must have been the same size. Now when we're translating this back to the mathematical setting, our containers A and B are our sets. And the act of pouring the volume of one into the other would be the use of a bijection. Thus, we can state the Kanner Schroeder Bernstein theorem pictorially like so. But how would you go about proving it? Doing so requires a bit of accounting. So just as we have a bijection f from a to a subset of b, let's call it b prime, we also have a bijection f inverse from that subset of b, b prime, to a. Similarly, since we have a bijection g from b to a subset of a, which we'll call a prime, we also have a bijection g inverse from a prime to b. Using the bijections f, g inverse, and f inverse, we are going to construct a bijection h from a to b. To do so, let's go ahead and just take some x, choose whichever one you want, in your set a. One of two things can happen. Either it's in a prime, or it's not. If it's not, we define h of x as f of x. If it is, then we can track it back into b using g inverse. Now two things can happen with g inverse of x. Either it is in b prime or it's not in b prime. If it is not, then we go ahead and define h of x as g inverse of x. If it is, we can track it back into a using f inverse. Here again, we see if f inverse of g inverse of x is in a prime or not, and then proceed accordingly. This flowchart defines how we determine what h does to an element of a. And in the case when we can go infinitely down the flowchart, we define h of x as equal to f of x. Now we need to show that this flowchart that constructed h is actually a bijection. Thankfully, the flowchart also gives us the tool required to do so, what we call the ancestors of x where if x has an even number of ancestors, our last ancestor is an a, and if x has an odd number of ancestors, our last ancestor is an b. I've went ahead and labeled the flowchart to show you what ancestors means here. There also may be infinitely many ancestors as well, where we can just keep tracing the element back further and further between the sets a and b, because every time stuff will fall into a prime or b prime. So if there are infinitely many ancestors, we're going to go ahead and say that h of x is just f of x. 
Now by looking at ancestors, we can partition A and B into different subsets by their ancestor designations. So A sub zero denotes an element of A that has an even number of ancestors. Similarly, A sub one denotes an element of A that has an odd number of ancestors, and A sub i denotes an element of A that has infinitely many ancestors. We can define B sub i, B sub zero, and B sub one in a similar fashion. By these constructions, we know that A sub i, A sub zero, and A sub one make up all of A. That means if you take the, their union, you'll get everything in A. And they're also pairwise disjoint. So if you intersect any pair of them, you're gonna get the empty set. And we can say the same exact things about b sub i, b sub zero, and b sub one. Now, if x has an even number of ancestors, f of x will have an odd number of ancestors, and b and b. And since f is a bijection to a subset of b, when we restrict f to a zero, it will retain the property of being one to one and onto. Thus, f restricted from a sub zero is a bijection from a sub zero to b sub one. Similarly, f is restricted from a sub i to b sub i, and g inverse restricted from a sub 1 to b sub 0 are also bijections. And when we go ahead and write down h concisely like so, we note that both f and g inverse are bijective on the sets on which these rules are defined for h. So h also must be bijective. And thus, we have constructed our desired bijection and proven the Kanner Schroeder Bernstein theorem. Now, that might be a little bit abstract. I know the first time I saw it, I was like totally confused and just like wrote down things and was not sure what was going on. But I never took the time to actually write down a physical example of what was happening. So this actually might help. We're gonna return to our claim back at the beginning of the video that the cardinality of the open interval from zero to one is equal to the cardinality of the closed interval from zero to one. So if we wanted to go ahead and just use the theorem, we could take functions f and g, which were defined in the following way. And so the two have the same cardinality by the Kanner Schroeder Bernstein theorem. But since the proof was constructive, we can actually construct the bijection and see what h looks like based on these two f and g. Since f is the identity, the inverse of f is also the identity, which is really helpful and makes this a lot easier to do. But g inverse is not as straightforward, but a little bit of arithmetic arrives you at this formula for g inverse. Visually, you can look at this as these two line se segments, one with open endpoints to denote the open interval and the other one with closed endpoints to denote the closed interval where we denote the subsets that f and g are bijective onto in this way, where we just mark them on the lines. Now by construction, h is equal to f when we have even or infinitely many ancestors, or g inverse when we have an odd number. So let's look at a couple points. Take for example, x equals to a half in the open interval of a. Notice that g inverse of x is also one half and so is f inverse of g inverse of x. This actually continues on forever. So x has infinitely many ancestors and thus h of x is equal to f of x, which is equal to 0.5. However, if we took a look at, let's say five eighths instead, we can trace it all the way back to one as g inverse of five eighths is three fourths and f inverse of three fourths is three fourths and g inverse of three fourths is one. Thus, since five eighths has an odd number of ancestors, and by the definition of h, we have h of five eighths is equal to g inverse of five eighths, which is equal to three fourths. Hopefully that helps flesh out the algorithm in play here a little bit when we're actually physically constructing these functions using the kanner schroeder bernstein theorem, but that's kind of all I had for you today. Um, things are gonna get a lot busier on my end because I just got a snazzy full-time job and have no idea what time management is, not like I did before, right? So I don't know if that's gonna affect my posting schedule, but I'm gonna try to keep it to two videos, um, or, well, a video every two weeks. And so if I can do that, I'm gonna be really proud of myself. If not, I'm gonna be really upset with myself. So 
<laughs> anyway, not important. Uh, with that little update, if you enjoyed this video, just uh, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more mathematics videos. Uh, if you want to see any other previous videos that I've done, uh, there are some cards up there that link to some relevant ones that are related to this stuff. But anyway, I am Nathan, this is Chalk, and I will see you next time.